So every year we try to um, get input from faculty and others about what sort of things you want to see. The purpose of these workshops are to be things that are applied. These are not necessarily research workshops, but the idea is that we um, are presenting things that you might be able to use in your classrooms starting tomorrow um, or with a little more um, uh, preparation if needed. So today what we have is a presentation from the AAU group and the AAU group is a project or the AAU project is a project led by Melanie Cooper she's the PI on it and she's going to tell you more about it but um, I just wanted to tell you so we don't forget all of the people that have been involved in this it's an interdisciplinary project focus on really the gateway courses in STEM but what we're doing is broadly applicable to um, other courses we have um, from physics Danny Caballero, JT Laverty. Danny will be part of the presenting team today. In chemistry, Melanie Cooper, Joe Krychek, Lynn Marie Posey, Sonia Underwood, and Justin Carmel. And then in biology, Diane Ebert May, who is supposed to be here eventually, uh, myself, Sarah Hardaliza, and Becky Matz. Um, the fo this is the, these are the folks that we'll be presenting today. Uh, some of these folks have moved on to other institutions, and some just aren't here today. So this is our workshop overview. First of all, we're going to try to run through and say hello to everyone, have everyone introduce themselves and tell us why you're here, why you're specifically interested in this workshop. If you could please keep it precise. We have, it's great to have all of you here and we want to make sure we get to all the good stuff. Um, so who's here and why? Then we will have an introduction to three-dimensional learning. Um, what, what is it and um, why should we use it in our courses? And that will come from Melanie Cooper. Um, we want to tell you that some of you are, are um, recognize that some of you may have heard this before. So we're going to try to keep it brief so we can get to the meat of the uh, workshop today, which will be using this new instrument, the 3D Lab. So then we will have an introduction to the 3D Lab. Um, I sent out a paper that hopefully you perused. Um, I brought some copies. I was hoping that some people would bring copies or computers so I didn't kill too many trees, but we will have some uh, um, copies available. And then we'll use the 3D lab to characterize some assessment items in a few different disciplines. We've brought examples from uh, different disciplines. And then after doing that, what we hope to do is have you refine some of those that don't elicit um, uh, three-dimensional uh, uh, evidence of three-dimensional learning from the students or to create new ones if you would prefer to, to create something for your own class okay so um, let's get started with introductions who is here and why so if you could give us a, a very quick um, hello my name is and why you're here so Joe would you like to start hello my name is Joe Ward I'm the coordinator of the general chemistry labs um, and just always here. <laughs> we, we breathe this now, so um, contribute as much as I can. Great. I'm Justin Carmel. I'm a postdoc in chemistry, working with um, Dr. Melanie Cooper, and we do chemistry education research. And I'm specifically a postdoc that's in charge of assessing the um, lab transformation. I work very closely with Joe um, and I'm presenting. Good reason to be here. Uh, I'm Lauren Siler. I'm a postdoc in geological sciences at Patrick. And I would be better teacher. Hi, I'm Soja. I'm a PhD student in fisheries and wildlife, and I'm also here to uh, learn more about this. Uh, I'm Sarathi. I'm a postdoc at biochemistry and molecular biology, and uh, I'm doing some teaching, so I want to do my teaching. I'm Sundari Chodavarpu in the Biochemistry Department of the Oakland Dental Fusion Committee, and I'm just a mom of staff at Carolina Kitchen, so I'm going to be a chief. Melanie Cooper, chemistry. Hi, I'm Melanie Cooper, and I'm also a postdoc in chemistry and molecular biology, and I'm here to help spread the word about three-dimensional work. Dan Kavira, I'm in physics, and I'm working on the project. Hi, I'm Dan Kavira, I'm working on the I'm Laura Simmons, I direct the undergraduate neuroscience program, and I'm here because we're starting to do so um, assessment work in neuroscience now we're, we're entering our fifth year and I'm also particularly you know, eager to make the neuroscience curriculum follow very um, seamlessly from the undergraduate basic science curriculum. Yeah, I'm Yunnan Yang from Mechanical Engineering. I'm a postdoc, came here for Learn How to Teach. 
I'm Sarah Iveson in the Animal Science Department with uh, Dr. Janice Sickford, and I want to learn more about teaching. I'm Janice Sickford, Animal Science, and I'm always interested in how to teach better to our students and how to do our curriculum revision updates with all of this in mind. I'm saying it's maybe a PhD. Ever Penchov, also chemistry, and I'm interested in new techniques and approaches for teaching. Hi everyone, I'm Dan Weller. I'm a material science grad student, and I'm here to learn more about teaching. <laughs> I told them we had to stand up, so I probably should too. <laughs> I'm Susie Jackson. I work in the Center of Integrated Studies, General Science. I teach a class called um, Science for Elementary Teachers, and we use 3D learning every day. And so, what I want to do is try to learn how to write better. We got a ringer. <laughs> <laughs> and another one. Uh, I'm Stephen Thomas. I'm in the Center for Integrated Studies and General Science. I also teach K-12, future uh, K-12 science teachers. And so this aligns very much with uh, with their approach in, in that system. So I'm looking to align my instruction with their training. My name is Bill Wills. I'm a postdoc in the Department of Entomology. I'm just here for skill building. I'm Camille Archer. I coordinate training for ICER, and uh, we put on a lot of workshops in research computing, and just got an REU grant funded. So I'm interested in understanding how to better assess those programs. Why don't we go back here? I'm Andrea Virma from Lyman Briggs, and I'm just interested in proving my assessment. I'm Lori Seishaub in physiology, and um, we've been looking at our undergrad curriculum for the past couple years pretty intensely, so we're always looking for new things to add to the discussion. Claire Vieille, Microbiology, and I am also looking at improving my assessment and active learning and things like that. I'm Charles Zuckstratton, Biochemistry. Um, I do a lot of teaching in BMB 461, so I'm, also, I'm always on the lookout for ideas, and I'm also sort of a, a consumer of the students who come out of the lower level courses, and so I try and stay in the loop on discussions of what they're up to. Let me just pause real quickly and mention that that is true for pretty much everybody here, right? So even if these examples don't apply to your class, your students are starting to get exposed to this before they get to you because pretty much everybody has to take chemistry, biology, and physics before they go to your upper level classes. So thanks, Charlie, for making that point. Yeah. I'm Neil White. Um, I'm a graduate student in biochemistry, and I've done a past fellowship, so I'm interested in uh, current teaching practices. I'm uh, Matt Schrenk. I'm uh, in microbiology and geology, and I'm just uh, trying to improve teaching and assessment with the courses I've developed. Uh, I'm Chris Sulavas-Leo. I teach organic chemistry, and I usually attend the things. Let's <laughs> Uh, I'm Devin Sylvia. I'm an NSF postdoctoral fellow uh, in the physics and astronomy group here, uh, and I'm pursuing teaching focused positions. So I'm trying to bolster my background. Um, <clears throat> I'm Travis. I'm a postdoc with Beacon, so I'm a science communication postdoc, and eventually I'll end up being college professor, so teaching is something important. I'm Claudia Vergara. I am the director of assessment and program evaluation in the Center for Integrated Studies in General Science. This is a mouthful. And I pretty much am interested in everything that has to do with assessment. I'm Rachel Morris. I'm a biomedical laboratory diagnostics in the College of Natural Science. And I'm interested in crafting my assessment. Karen Renner, plant soil microbial sciences. Interested in teaching better. I teach 400 level, 400 and 800, and try to see all the solids. I'm Ronnie Armstrong. I'm visiting here. I come from Chile from the Catholic University. I teach organic chemistry there. And my reason for coming here is to learn how to do our teaching assessment. So I'm very happy to have this opportunity. Jane Zimmerman, I'm from Mathematics, and uh, I'm involved in the Dow STEM program. So I'm teaching a redesigned Mathematics 25 and 103, and I'm interested in improving the assessments. <coughs> Ian Tom from computer science and engineering, uh, and I teach 3D computer graphics. And I have to say, undergrads or grads in our department does not have much knowledge in physics, so I would like to, to engage them in learning physics for 
committer animation. Great. We figured we'd put the engineering folks with you. That's Sure. Uh, my name is Neil Hammer. Um, I'm in microbiology, molecular genetics, and I'm in the stages learning more about teaching. I'm Jan Dufour. I'm in microbiology and molecular genetics, and I'm teaching uh, microbial genomics. Kelly Mullenbosso, CD, College of Ag and Natural Resources, one of the co coordinators of the STEM teaching essentials. Say Houston, all from science and human nutrition. I'm to learn. Uh, I'm Steve Abbatak. Uh, I am a postdoctor in microbiology and working with the flu. Uh, I'm, uh, I have a teaching group in, in my country back, so I would like to learn more and more about uh, this view of about several teaching degrees. I'm Suzanne Lang. I'm Associate Dean of the College of Ag and Natural and also one of the co-sponsors for these teaching workshops. I'm AJ Robison. Uh, I'm a professor in physiology and neuroscience. I teach a 400 level uh, neuroscience course and some 400 and 800 level lectures in uh, neuroscience and physiology and I want to get better at it. Um, this is Wade Bowen. I'm from Lao, AMB, Department of Science and I'm a postdoc work with the I want to get an idea how I can use from the workshops in my next semester. I will like the fastest inventory of that course. <coughs> my name is Andreas Tomato. I just joined the faculty in the high energy physics group, and um, um, I arrived from Germany and teach there before. But um, I would be particularly interested in learning how to teach uh, these um, large classes. Uh, so I have no experience with that, and. Um, I'm Mark Urban Lorraine, I'm a Create for STEM Institute, I'm also a student from teaching subjects. Jason Bowser, Physiology, and Career Learning Facility. I'm Alison Behrendt, I'm a postdoc in the Microbiology Department at Stanford University. I'm Alison Behrendt, I'm a postdoc in the Microbiology Department, and I don't teach yet, but I want to be prepared for when I do. Danielle Lopez, uh, College of Natural Sciences, the Director of Student Success, and I just want to learn more about teaching. I'm Michael Merlo, I'm in the CMSE department, and as a department that's one year old only, it would be mm -hmm. good to learn some of these techniques as that curriculum is built. Uh, my name is uh, Chen Chen, assistant professor in the animal science department. So it's more relevant to me, I'm developing a new graduate level course, so I come here to borrow some ideas today. So I'm Rob Malechka in chemistry. Uh, next spring I'll be teaching organic for pre-meds. Enough said. <laughs> I'm Sam Shukin. I'm a new faculty in BMB and um, chemistry department. I'm here to learn about um, more about the effective teaching. I'm John Zubek, a new faculty in physiology, and I've been assigned to start a new uh, lab course for pre health professionals. So I'm interested since it's a new class, I really want to develop assessments that are also new and creative and um, well developed. Uh, Marty Spranger from Physiology. I teach uh, Intro Physiology with around 550 students, uh, BS 161 with around 250, so I'm always interested in ways of uh, better engaging students. Well, thanks everybody. Um, that helps us try to think about what we need to do sort of on the fly when we get you to um, go into groups and, and try to figure out how to divide everybody up. Um, and the, another goal of all of these kinds of efforts, like the teaching essentials, is to um, help develop a community of, of folks who are committed to STEM education. And so try, starting to put names with faces and those sorts of things um, really helps to uh, facilitate that. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Melanie Cooper, who is going to um, go through the introduction to three-dimensional learning. So. I have to stand here so, I'm, so I don't roam from the microphone, uh, but I probably will, so you let me know if I roam. Um, so I, my first thing is to apologize to those of you, those of you who have seen this before, uh, but I know some, many of you haven't, so uh, we decided I would just give it this kind of brief overview. 
and um, our AAU project and the transformation that is underway in many of the STEM gateway courses is actually based on the uh, framework for K-12 science education and uh, this was developed by uh, experts from all over, it was released in 2012 and sets forth a vision for science education, not just at the K-12 level, but what, the, what it has to say is also highly relevant to us. And that is that students um, over years engage in science and engineering practices, cross-cutting ideas, and, and uh, deepen their understanding of core ideas. So I, I just want to kind of briefly give you an overview of what, what this means. Um, and so the first one is core ideas. Why core ideas? Why, what do we mean when we say core ideas? And where does this come from? And it comes from the, the large literature base that we have now, that we know that experts knowledge is organized uh, into an underlying framework that's different uh, than beginners. Uh, it reflects a, a, a deep understanding of the discipline and uh, it allows, it's contextualized and coherent and it allows experts to use their knowledge in new ways. Now we're not expecting every beginning STEM student to become an expert, but what we do want to do is to help them develop more expert-like thinking in the way that they approach their, their science and engineering. So an expert then learns some new things, some bricks for their foundation, and from that they build uh, a beautiful palace. Okay, so we as experts in our field, uh, I know this is not a palace, but it's, it's beautiful, okay? <laughs> and, and it's contextualized and coherent, you know, we can use it, it's got purpose. Uh, but unfortunately, far too often what happens with our students is that we teach them many, many pieces and fragments of information, and what ends up at the end is that they just have a bigger pile of fragments and pieces, and they're not coordinated, and they're not contextualized, and therefore they can't use them in the next course, they forget because they're not connected, and uh, it just is um, the structure of many of these STEM gateway courses that are designed as surveys, that are a mile wide and an inch deep, uh, you can't help but um, end up with students who've got a big pile of essentially rubbish because they can't use it. Um, and I, I was looking back over some of my old stuff and what I found um, was in fact that um, I too used to do this. So here are my learning objectives. This is just for one chapter. And um, they're, you know, they're all fragments, fragments of information that students should be able to do with, with nothing uh, putting them together. So I just want to, um, I, I, I know everything that uh, anyone's ever done wrong, I, I believe I have done wrong in my teaching, so I, I, I know where I'm coming from. So disciplinary core ideas are not fragments, they're central to the discipline. Uh, they allow for deep exploration of ideas. Um, they're an organizational structure for the acquisition of new ideas, and they allow for generation of new ideas. Ideally, if we, if we build our curricula around these core ideas, this provides the framework for students to, um, to build a more expert-like uh, knowledge. So, um, this is actually the same thing. Uh, but here we have, um, you know, some examples. So in biology, obviously, evolution is a core idea that runs throughout the whole discipline. In chemistry, uh, molecular structure predicts macroscopic properties. It's a core idea that runs throughout the whole discipline. And in physics, force and momentum, and so on and so forth. These are just examples. They're not the full list. And the, our AAU project has worked for many long hours. <laughs> Uh, deciding what we thought the core ideas for our particular disciplines and courses were. Um, and this builds on um, 
this idea that no the knowledge that students have has to be linked and contextualized. If it's linked around these core ideas, it helps them build a better understanding. So not only must we think about what we're going to teach them, we have to have we have to understand what the prior knowledge is that students have. We have to link what we teach them onto that prior knowledge. Uh, otherwise, it'll be lost, it'll become a fragment. And not only that, we have to anticipate where we're going with it. If students don't know where we're going with the future knowledge, then um, sometimes uh, the, it, it gets lost. So um, w the core ideas should be developed over time. So core ideas should be coherent to a discipline, not just a course, but a whole discipline, and can be developed uh, in increasingly more sophisticated uh, descriptions of how students uh, understand and build their knowledge. But um, it turns out that conceptual knowledge, even conceptual, uh, content knowledge, but even conceptual knowledge is not enough. If students only know things and they can't use their knowledge, then you know, it's not very useful. So we, we bring in the science, pr scientific and engineering practices, actually. Um, a set of practices that are used to establish and extend and refine that knowledge. So both knowledge and practices are essential, and I'm not going to you know, run through all these because you, you read uh, the 3D lab, I think. But these scientific and engineering practices are how we put knowledge to use. Uh, if you think about, often we talk about inquiry, the practices might be thought of as the disaggregated components of inquiry. These are things that we, we all do in our everyday scientific lives. Uh, and we should be expecting that students also do them. Um, the third leg of the uh, three-dimensional learning is the cross-cutting concepts. And this goes to the idea that we're not teaching in a silo. Uh, we shouldn't be teaching in a silo. Students are taking more than one course at a time. There are concepts that cross uh, across disciplines, uh, energy, comes to mind, for example. Uh, and there are things that, we, that students need to understand from one course to another. So the NRC defined a set of cross-cutting concepts as well. Um, and here they are. Uh, some of them, they're not, these are not all the same, but you, um, I think nobody would disagree that these are things that uh, in STEM courses that we expect our students to have a handle on, and we also expect them to be able to uh, move them from course to course, although often we're you know, sadly disappointed. So um, three-dimensional learning then takes the three dimensions, right? but the point is that we want them to be integrated. We want them to be blended together we don't want on one day to learn scientific practices and on one day to learn concepts. The idea is that we want all of these things blended together um, so, that we, so that students uh, not only have a deep and robust understanding of contextualized knowledge, but they also know how to use it. Um, so if we think about more typical learning approaches, um, so here I'm going to take, again, uh, a typical learning objective, um, which I'm taking chemistry because I'm a chemist, but you know how it is. Um, so this learning objective merely requires that students memorize a trend, all right? And students can do this. If we want a three-dimensional learning a performance expectation, then what we would have to do is to include the three dimensions. So we want them to construct an explanation, and the practice is an explanation, uh, to look at the patterns in periodic trends, a cross-cutting concept, and then the core idea, uh, there are two core ideas here, of interactions and uh, structure property relationships. And you can see that this is constructed very differently and requires very different response than this. 
Um, and here's another one. Uh, understand is a terrible word, as I'm sure you know. Uh, how do you know? You have to have evidence for it. Um, so uh, something that might elicit evidence is to construct a model and use it to explain, all right, modeling, how and why is a cause and effect, uh, the temperature changes when a salt dissolves in water. Right? So the overall goal then is to integrate these uh, and blend core idea, disciplinary core ideas, scientific practices, and cross-cutting concepts, and to develop assessments. So I believe we're at the next part. And then, is it yeah. Danny? Right. So, uh, like Melanie was saying, I think one of the things that we're interested in talking about here is how do you actually construct assessments, things that you would have students do that engage them with this? And so, um, what we draw from is the literature on backward design, or you can think of it as constructive alignment, whatever, whatever you prefer. Um, but the idea is that you identify the things that you want, which is what Melanie was talking about in terms of learning goals. Um, you determine what you're going to accept as evidence that students have gotten there and then you're gonna plan your instruction around that. And so this part of what we're talking about is actually, how do we determine what the acceptable evidence is, given that what we're interested in is this, this three-dimensional side of learning, okay? Um, and so what we've developed is the 3D Lab, the three-dimensional learning assessment protocol, which is a tool for characterizing assessment items along these three dimensions in chemistry, biology, and physics. Um, I mean, that's how it's contextualized anyway. Um, and what this does for us is it sets some criteria. It says these are the things that we will accept from an assessment item to say that it has the potential to elicit three-dimensional learning. Now, we're not looking at how students, or we haven't looked at how students engage with those materials. Um, and we're doing that in a way so that you can actually look at the assessment items and say, does this, is it possible that this thing will elicit that? And just doing that is confronting a big part of the planning that you would do. And then looking at how your students engage, you know, you can refine it, right? So this is, again, the, the potential. We're not saying that um, this necessarily does it. Um, so we developed this from the framework and looking at existing items that were in physics, chemistry, and biology. Um, so here's a typical uh, physics problem. I'm a physicist, so here's, here's some, uh, something that some of you are familiar with and other of you have probably blocked out of your mind um, <laughs> from your physics course. That's fine. Uh, but the idea is you have some pendulum, you have some mass that's sitting on a string here and it's making some angle and it's rotating around in a circle and there's some question about the force that's acting on the mass and we asked this question in our intro courses and it's a pretty standard sort of numerical question um, and so we want to characterize that that example to understand does it have the potential to elicit three-dimensional learning um, and so we go back to this I'm gonna step over here because I've been talking to them um, <laughs> We go back to the three dimensions, and what we do is we, we, I'll give you the punchline, it doesn't align with scientific practices, it doesn't align with cross-cutting concepts, but it does have this concept of interactions cause changes in motion, which is a big um, cro um, disciplinary core idea in physics. Um, so how do we get here? Well, I'm not gonna go through all of it. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick one of these and show you kind of how we evaluate this item against the criteria that we developed. So, um, so we'll start with, we'll just do scientific practices, okay? So um, here's the uh, practice that we thought was most relevant to this, um, developing and using models. I should say that the criteria that you're going to see here is actually um, platform agnostic. That's not the way to say it. Disciplinary agnostic? OK. Um, that is that, that the idea of modeling can be applied to chemistry and biology and physics. And that took a lot of negotiation and discussion to make that happen. Um, but it, we're pretty proud that we did it. Um, took a long time. Okay, so uh, the first, the first uh, statement of the criteria is that the question gives an event, observation, or phenomenon for the student to explain or make a prediction about. So the idea here is that there is some real world phenomenon that the student is having to um, connect with in some way. Well, it fails that. This is, I could bring it back up, but it's already a highly idealized situation, right? It's a ball, a string with no mass, in a, moving in a circle. I mean, it is what it is. Uh, the question gives the student a representation or asks the student to select a representation. Well, there was a picture there, right, that described the situation. So, okay, we, we do get that. That's nice. Um, it asks them to select an explanation for the event or, an uh, or the observation or the phenomenon using the representation. So, um, or make a prediction about it, right? They're obviously having to do that. Um, they're predicting something about the force that acts on that ball. 
And then the last thing is it asks them to select the reasoning that would actually link these two, right? So how do you actually make the connection? You don't just do the mathematics, but what is the connection here from the underlying physics or the underlying principles that would connect this understanding? Well, I mean, obviously you're not asked about that. So, um, so this question, you know, is, is it's not unique in the sense that we have a lot of questions like this that we ask in physics where we, we give students a highly idealized situation and ask them to calculate something. Um, but it doesn't really fully represent the practice of modeling in physics. So um, what we've done, uh, JT and I worked on uh, modifying this assessment item to have a little bit more of this, this sense of like getting these other criteria hit. So the first thing we do is we actually ground it in there's, you know, your friends are playing tetherball and it looks, and you know, we're asking you to think about the observation you see, which is that um, as the ball moves faster, the angle that it makes is larger, right? Um, and there's some discussion about does everybody know what tetherball is, and that's, that's fair enough. Um, so the first question asks them, you know, which of the following free body diagrams makes sense, right? So starting with, like, you construct the representation, choose the right one. Um, and then um, we ask them to combine the equations they obtained using the free body diagram. So they have to have some step here that describes, like, that they're going to write down all the equations and so forth. Um, but which of the following actually explains the observation? So which of the following of these, which is like what happens when the speed changes, how does that actually change the thing, right? So let's connect it back and explain what the actual underlying physics is, right? How are the speed and the, and the angle connected and in what ways? And so once we do that, we, we, we would argue that we actually are hitting these other two things. We're, we're, we're actually grounding it in a, in a real world phenomenon and we're actually <laughs> asking the student to link some reasoning to the thing that's interesting about that phenomenon, okay? So um, once we spent some time with that, we were able to think about a way of using the criteria to reconstruct assign, um, uh, these kinds of assessment items to actually align with the concept of developing and using models, systems and system models, and obviously it still has this interactions cause changes in motion. So the reason for going through this example is actually because one of the plans that we have for y'all is to go through some examples of, of assessment items used on our campus and to use the criteria to kind of go through and see if you can make sense of them um, and then maybe try to modify them if we have time, but mainly to try to get a sense of like, what are the features of these things that this group has decided on to help us understand what we're asking of our students, okay? Um, so that sort of turns to the um, characterizing of assessment items and where's Corey? Oh, hey Corey. So are we handing those things out now? Yeah, so there's okay. a, a slide with okay. instructions. Okay. Yeah. So I should go through this? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> what I'll ask you to do is to review the 3D lap, which um, we have some copies of, right. um, so but it is also in we'll the email, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then there are different colored papers here, blue, pink, green, and purple. Just model those for you. Um, so if you're interested in physics or if you're, um, if you're in engineering, I think we asked, you know, particular kinds of engineering rather, we asked that you join the physics group um, and pick up one of these pink ones. Um, chemistry, blue, solid molecular biology, purple, organismal and population biology, green. If you don't fit into these categories nicely, that's fine. Come talk to us and we will figure out what is going on. Um, <laughs> why are you here? Is that the free food? It's probably the free food. Um, <laughs> So we'll go through the 3D lap, and what we would like you to do is, in, is sort of breaking up into those groups. Each of us is going to help facilitate the conversation around that, um, but the idea would be to look at the 3D lap in the context of these items and have a conversation around how those criteria get applied, how do we make sense of it, um, and, then, um, and then discussing those results more broadly in our group is what we'll do at the end. Um, and if there's time, we, will, we have another activity mm -hmm. planned. Mm -hmm. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, do, all right. All right. So if you need a 3D lap, raise your hand and we'll start passing those out. I hope everybody had as good a conversation as we have back in the corner. I hope the people in the corner enjoyed it as much as I did. I thought it was exhilarating, but I'm a dork, so um, we'll see. Um, so hopefully um, you had a chance to really get into using the 3D lab. It was originally designed not only as a tool to um, uh, characterize assessments, 
but it was also designed in mind to um, provide a tool that you can use to develop new questions. And I know I teach BioSci 161. My exams, still very few of the questions elicit 3D, uh, evidence of 3D learning because it's hard to do this. But having conversations like this, like we had in the back, that helps me. I hope it was helpful to you to start to think about how you can infuse this into your own courses. So if you have questions and you want to reach out to others, um, you've met the team now. Most of the team that's still here on campus is here. and. Um, the team that's on campus is here and um, we're all willing to talk to you to, to take a look at materials to try to take this a step further that's really the overall goal okay okay so um, our, we have two more um, stem um, uh, teaching essentials workshop scheduled for this semester um, we will have one on team learning I can't remember which dates they are but one on team learning will be led by Kendra Cherivello who is an associate professor over in Lyman Briggs College and in fisheries and wildlife and she's done a whole lot of work on figuring out how to put groups of students together which is something I think a lot of us try to do and how to manage that effectively how to really have students engage in cooperative learning not just being in a group so uh, it should be a very good workshop. And then we also have one um, coming from some of our BioSci 161 instructors about team teaching. What, what can you do to really team teach and not tag team teach, where somebody takes the first six weeks and then somebody else takes the next six weeks? How can you work together to uh, create a, a better learning environment for the students when you work with or when you teach with multiple people? Okay, so thanks for coming. And, and oh yes, and please.